Ardbeg 10 year old. Is it a modern day Isla classic? And is it the best in the Ardbeg core range? Let's discuss it. Hey guys, welcome back to Whiskey on the West Coast. My name is Matt. And today we're going to be talking about Ardbeg 10 year old Isla single malt Scotch whiskey. Now, I'm a little bit shocked. I'm very surprised that it's taken me this long to get around to uh, reviewing an Isla single malt Scotch whiskey. I'm obsessed with Isla. I love it. And to be around, like, I think this is going to be my 15th video and not having reviewed one gotta fix that. And so I am today by reviewing Ardbeg 10 year old, which I believe may just be a, um, a modern Isla classic, just hanging out on liquor store shelves across the world. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, that question, if it is this modern day Isla classic. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just briefly touch on the distillery history because that's been kind of beaten to death. Uh, some of the specs on this bottle and the information you need to know. Get to the review. And then after that, we're going to talk about uh, where this uh, bottle winds up in the Ardbeg core range, uh, a popular, unpopular opinion, and kind of like a, a teaser for one of the uh, videos that's coming out shortly after this in the next couple of videos, uh, where this is kind of leading. All right, Ardbeg, a distillery that doesn't actually need an introduction uh, with whiskey drinkers, especially anybody watching this video, but I'm going to give it a short one here. Uh, it's located on the south shore of Isla. Uh, next to Lagavulin and Lefroy. They're actually very close neighbors. If you ever happen to be visiting Isla or have visited in, in the past, you'll know that uh, they're actually walking distance to each other. Uh, so you can go from distillery to distillery to distillery, uh, which I hope to do uh, hopefully this summer. Uh, outside of that, established in 1815. Now there was some, or there is some record of illicit distilling on the site prior to that. I'm not certain of the years, so I'm just gonna go with what's on the bottle. Say it was established 1815. Uh, past this, there's actually quite a history of um, closures in Ardbeg's past. Uh, but most recently, it changed hands in 1997 when Moet Hennessy went ahead and bought Ardbeg. They were currently the owners of Glen Morangi. And uh, you can actually see some similarities in the branding between these two um, brands. Uh, especially with their special releases. If you look at Glen Morangi, uh with their like Tale of Winter, Tale of Cake, uh, Tale of the Forest, and compare that to some of the more recent Ardbeg Committee releases like Scorch or Ardcore, you can tell that there's, um, there is a, a common uh, thread that pulls through uh, all the marketing, and that is the marketing team for Moet Hennessy. Um, outside of that, we, uh, we should talk about the, the, the vital stats in this bottle, which are uh, this bottle is bottled at 46% ABV. It's non-chill filtered. It's natural color. Yeah, you can definitely tell natural color on this art bag. And it is uh, a vatting of first fill X bourbon and uh, refill X bourbon casks. And for uh, heat uh, level, it's about 50 uh, phenol parts per million. Uh, it's actually, it kind of puts it for the actual standard range of whiskeys on Isla. I believe that's the peatiest uh, of, of the lot. And that peat actually comes from Port Ellen maltings. And that's important to note because starting in 2023, uh, Port Ellen is actually going to be limiting uh, the amount of peat it distributes to non-Diageo owned distilleries. And that's important because again, Ardbeg, they're getting their peat from Port Ellen. Same with um, some of Coloman, uh, Coloman's peat. Uh, Lafroig, uh, off Isla, you got Legig that uses uh, peat and, and malt sourced from Port Allen maltings. Uh, so that's going to be a story to watch uh, in the future and see how that develops. All right, let's get to the review. So for the review, uh, I'm just going to note right away that this is a beautifully light color on this whiskey. And we can talk about the color because it is natural color. It has been uh, messed around with, which is great. And even just looking at the color, it makes me think of, of refill bourbon casks. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a sniff here. 
Mm. Okay. Right away. Smoke. Um, lots of it. But if your nose can go pea blind like mine can, uh, right away you're also picking up fruit. Um, lemon, so like citrus, lime. Um, really sort of like a, a mezcal thing going on here because there's some salt too. Um, not not a lot of it, not, not a huge amount, but you've got lemon, lime, smoke, some salt. That sounds like a margarita, honestly, a uh, mezcal margarita. Yeah, some um, like dock tar uh, and creosote uh, coming from that smoke. Really heavily peated whiskey here, for sure. Not like optimal heavily peated. Don't don't go crazy, but uh, 50 ppm is, is no joke. Mm. Again, the lemon is so dominant um, for the, the the fruits on this nose. There's some pear too, and with that, those ex bourbon casks, vanilla, very clearly vanilla. And so for me, that's almost like a like a, a, a flambéed lemon meringue pie. So he had a lemon uh, meringue pie and he kind of just like scorched the top of it or something. Um, something ridiculous like that. Ridiculous tasting notes. Whiskey tasters are known for it. Let's embrace it. All right, I'm gonna take a sip. Okay, there is a whole smoking room um, in my mouth, um, like cigar smoke, chocolate, mm. really nice chocolate right now coming through. Yeah, um, oh man, first sip of hard is wonderful. The citrus fruits pull through from the nose as well. Uh, it, it's almost like a cold smoke. There's a meatiness to it. Um, so maybe like um, and the sweetness too. So maybe like a maple bacon. Oh man, that looks good. Tar, creosote, big smoke, big peat, vanilla, really nice, strong, malty backbone to it. Mm. Like a salted caramel thing, lime, lime right now. Oh my gosh. Hardbag, never, never change, never change your 10 year old. Your 10 year old's the ticket. And then the finish, once you get to this point after that sip, because there, there was some pepper too, I should note that there was some peppering, some spice uh, in the palate as well, that helped give it some heft. And the body was really good. 46% uh, is, is just perfect for this. Um, the finish is actually really gentle. It's really delightful and is almost like a nice come down from such a big palate. It's, yeah, this whiskey, it, it always, it always delivers. It's consistent in its delivery, and I love it for that. One more sip, and then we'll uh, get to a score. Mm. Just in my happy place here, dancing a little bit. Just like this art bag on my tongue. Oh man. I've, I've given me everything I've got for the tasty notes there, guys. Um, I think that says it all. Uh, we, most people who've watched this, I think we've probably already had art bag. So I'm just preaching to the choir here. Consistent delivery of flavor and taste and complexity. It's a crowd pleaser all around for anyone who loves peated whiskey. Score on this is gonna be 89 out of 100. It is a great value. Um, 
usually about $70 Canadian if you're getting it out, out of Alberta. I even found it on offer in BC for right around $70 too. Um, I believe it's still a really reasonable price in the UK and other markets. It's just so consistently good and for such a good price. It is hard to argue with this bottle uh, being on every bar shelf uh, of every whiskey drinker across the face of this planet. 89 of 100. Yeah, that's the score right there. Okay, so let's talk about how the Ardbeg 10 stacks up against the rest of the core range. Uh, and when I'm talking core, core range, I'm not talking about uh, the Treg Van or whatever it's called, the like $400 uh, Ardbeg uh, 19 year old or something like that. I'm talking about Ardbeg Wee Beastie, the five year old, Ardbeg 10, Ardbeg NO, Oogdal, and Cory Brecken. Uh, now, I don't have enough experience with NO to give too much of a background on that. Um, I've kind of focused on the other four bottlings in that group. So if you really love the NO, comment down below. Let me know that I need to be trying it. Otherwise, I'm probably just going to continue buying these four bottles. However, um, Ardbeg Wee BC, five-year-old. It's great. It's great for a five-year-old whiskey. Um, it's really interesting to drink that side by side with Octomore being of the same age. Huge difference in ABV and the actual process to get to that result. It's big, it's brash, and it's just a fun drink. However, it doesn't have the balance of this 10 year old. It isn't the finely tuned and well oiled machine that the 10 year old is. Um, on top of that, uh, popular unpopular opinions coming up here you may be uh, yelling at the screen I, I'm pretty sure I could hear you from uh, from here um, Ardbeg Oogdal I love it I love the peat and sherry combination it is so Moorish it's like sweet barbecue and smoked meats oh, just like slathered in sauce and syrup it's, it's it's delicious I went through my bottle and I haven't replaced it yet um, that said um, I think the 10 is my preferred drinker. I'll get more into the reasons why in just a moment. Cory Vrecken, again, what a banger of a whiskey. I think Ugdal and Cory Vrecken are technically uh, the better whiskeys. They're both bottled at cast strength, and I've heard uh, an Ardbeg rep uh, actually refer to them as, uh, like, at least Ugdal as teenage Ardbeg. So, I'm assuming there's some age in there too. <sighs> that said, I think Ardbeg 10 is probably the best of the core range, and that's the unpopular opinion. But I've heard a few people talk about this, and here's why I'm of that mind. Um, it is one of the clearest and most well done um, representations of Ardbeg's distillery signature of what they do best. It's coming to us strictly from these bourbon casks, a lot of it being uh, refill. Uh, ex bourbon, which just allows the spirit to sing. It is singing loud and clear, and we get to see Ardbeg unadulterated. It hasn't been messed around with. On top of that, it's not cast strength. I love cast strength whiskey. Don't get me wrong. It, it's kind of where I go to. Whiskey is meant to be shared. It's meant to be uh, broken out for people who are coming over. You're, it's meant to be brought with you to wherever you're going, and it's meant to be doled out to friends and family, strangers alike. And cast strength isn't something that's necessarily friendly for all people. 46% alcohol is much more approachable. And for those reasons, along with the value, the price point, Ardbeg Oogdal, for instance, is $150 plus in my market. If I can still sometimes get this for 70, it's going up to 110 slowly there's still some sales up there keep digging guys um 10 is just the perfect balance point in the entire Ardbeg core range so for that reason the best in the core range for Ardbeg for me is the Ardbeg 10. i'm sorry yell at me in the comments all right 89 points out of 100. i think it was a fantastic score for any malt at that price and getting back to the original question of this whole review is, is this a modern day classic Isla single malt scotch whiskey? And I would argue, yes, absolutely. I think this is one of the standard bearers for Isla right now. It's a flagship whiskey for Isla. If someone uh, hasn't tried an Isla whiskey, they want to try Isla Pete, 
I'm going to send them in the direction of Ardbeg 10. Why? Because they seem to be doing everything right. And they seem to be consistent in their delivery on that. And in particular, I think they do a really good job of showing off the style, showing off that peated Isla whiskey style um, with this uh, first fill X bourbon and refill X bourbon cask um, vatting. It's just, it's beautiful. It really lets the spirit sing. It's gorgeous. And I don't know if there's a legitimate challenger to its throne right now. If we talk about this, I'm a big Lefroig fan. Probably Lefroig has my heart more than Ardbeg as a distillery. However, um, Ardbeg's entry, uh, not Ardbeg, Lefroig's entry level uh, releases leave something to be desired. A Lefroig 10. Um, depending what market you're in, you're looking at 40% alcohol or 43% alcohol. It's colored to death and it is chill filtered. A lot could be improved upon. Um, and for that reason, I don't think Lefroy 10 has the edge on Ardbeg. Although, if you really love the medicinal TCP sort of thing, a lot of that like seaweed, um, yeah, I, I mean, you, you might just skew to Lefroy instead of Ardbeg. Furthermore, Lagavulin 16, one of those whiskeys that really brought people to peated whiskey. A lot of people, that's their first peated whiskey that they fell in love with. And like, yes, I get it now. They've kind of uh, priced their fans and their, their customers out of their own market. Uh, recent price increases, I mean, Lagavulin 16 is well over $150 in my market. I'm not buying it again. I love that whiskey. I'm not shelling out that those kind of dollars for it. Just won't do it. Lagavulin 8, some potential there. Good value at what it is, and it, and it shows well. Um, but it's not the 16. So, to the point here, um, I talked about uh, teasing a video in the future that's coming up, and that's going to be revolving around whether Ardbeg 10 stands up to its competitors. I'm going to be doing a semi-blind uh, showdown, kind of like my cast strength showdown, that is pitting Ardbeg 10 against three challengers, because I think it's the one that is currently holding the title belt. And so, I'm going to have Lefroig quarter cask as one of those bottles going up against Ardbeg 10. Why the quarter cask? Because it's a bit higher in ABV at 48% alcohol. There's a lot of people that seem to enjoy it more than the Le uh, Lefroig 10. I think it's a good challenger to that throne. It's about six to eight years old is my understanding, but those quarter casks help round out the maturation a bit quicker. So that'll be interesting to see how those two go head to head. Furthermore, we've got Lagavulin an eight-year-old, already talked about it. Um, I believe this relies a lot on refill ex bourbon casks, uh, much like the uh, classic Lagavulin 12 cast strengths do. Uh, Lagavulin 12 cast strength 2017 is one of my all-time favorite Isla Singwalt Scotch whiskeys. And the eight uh, is kind of shades toward that uh, same style of those 12 cast strengths. It's bottled at 48% alcohol, so it's a bit higher proof. It's not 43% like the Lagavulin 16. Again, I think there's some healthy competition here, and this also profiles a lot with that kind of mezcal spiritness, uh, spiritiny uh, aspect of it with like some citrus and some smoke. Um, really good competitor. And then another whiskey that's getting a lot of headlines right now because Ralphie picked it as his whiskey of the year. It's relatively a newcomer on the block. That's going to be Brook Lottie's Port Charlotte, heavily peated, single malt Isla Scotch Whiskey. This whiskey, 50% alcohol, even more flavor um, packed into this bottle uh, through ABV. It's non-chill filter, it's natural color, heavily peated. And I really love the lactic laddie note in this bottle. I love that as a distillery signature from Brook Laddie. There's a lot of fruit. It's heavily peated. I've got my work cut out for me with these four bottles going up head-to-head uh, -head with each other, not knowing what's in each glass. I'm really excited about this head-to-head -head because for me, it'll kind of put this issue to rest, which is the best of these four bottles and what could be uh, my flagship Isla single malt scotch whiskey going forward. Thanks for joining me here again today, guys. I know it's been a little bit long. Thanks for indulging me. Um, if you haven't already, if you can go ahead and subscribe, uh, like this video, share it, and comment down below. What is your flagship or standard bearer 
Isla single malt scotch whiskey of the um, accessible core range. What is the bottle that you will always have on your shelf to represent Isla and to be able to share with people who haven't had it before? All right. Thanks for joining me on Whiskey on the West Coast. Sláinte.